Good afternoon. Welcome to the third webinar in the 2011 series from MBF Bioscience. My name is Susan Hendricks. As a staff scientist, I also run the day-to-day -day operations of MBF Labs, a contract research facility for stereology here at MBF. I'm joined today by my colleague at MBF Labs, Alyssa Wilson. Say hi, Alyssa. Hi, everyone. Welcome. As an analyst for MBF Labs, I generate data using Stereo Investigator on a day-to-day -day basis. This includes creating virtual slides, serial sections, neuron reconstruction, counting neurons, glia, inclusion bodies for number estimation, and of course, volume estimation. Today we'll be presenting stereological techniques for area and volume estimation using Stereo Investigator. At this time, please take a moment to adjust the volume of your speakers. Our voices will not be as loud as the test voice, so you may need to turn up the volume. Our hearts go out to our colleagues and friends in Japan affected by the tsunami and earthquake. Uh, I just wanted to mention that you guys are in our thoughts. The goal for today's webinar is to provide a practical demonstration of area and volume estimation using Stereo Investigator. The data you require to test your hypothesis will ultimately Drive what analyses you need to perform. Area and volume estimation are very straightforward. We will walk you through the many ways you can collect data using Stereo Investigator. Finally, we'll end by discussing ways to evaluate the obtained data. There will be a short break after the design and application segments where we will address questions that have been submitted via the question window. Feel free to ask your questions via the question window at any point. If you have additional questions that were not addressed by the conclusion of the presentation, please email your questions to info at mbfbioscience.com. We record our webinars and make them available on our website, www.mbfbioscience.com. This webinar will join uh, those already recorded in about a week, so um, return there for a refresh if you'd like. Today, a great deal of biological research in the study of health and human disease relies on histological analyses. Every researcher desires to make an accurate statement about their hypothesis. However, we want to balance effort with accuracy to obtain needed results. Instead of performing a three-dimensional serial section reconstruction, design-based stereological tools can be used to estimate areas and volumes efficiently. Design-based stereology is a set of unbiased methods for quantitative analysis of size, shape, and number of objects. The Cavalieri method is a stereological probe for quantifying regional, and area, ooh, regional area and volume estimates. Another probe, the area fraction fractionator, is used to estimate the area and volume fraction of a region occupied by a subregion. In 1635, Bonaventura Cavalieri published his Method of Indivisibles, the approach we use today for rapid and efficient volume estimation. He showed that volume could be comprised of an indefinite number of parallel planar area measurements. Volume of the object is estimated by summing the areas and multiplying by a slice thickness. There's a lot of different methods for measuring area. For example, Cavalieri and his original um, analysis actually weighed cross sections of a uh, ship in order to calculate the, the hold volume for that ship. Um, we're going to use point counting as a method to calculate area, which involves marking points on a defined grid that falls on your region of interest. Unbiased results require unbiased data collection. You must be able to describe the methods by which you're determining your region of interest. Therefore, your anatomical boundaries are of critical importance. If you can't define it, you can't measure it with accuracy. A randomized start as well as a systematic interval through your region of interest is necessary for unbiased data collection. The Cavalieri approach requires an initial random cut through your region of interest with subsequent sections at consistent intervals that is, systematic, uniform, random sampling. The distance between your area measurements will equal the section sampling fraction multiplied by the section thickness. With a few sections through your region, there is overestimation in the estimated volume. This is called an overprojection er error. The amount of overprojection is inversely proportional 
to the number of sections through your region of interest. So the solution to that is to use more sections. You want approximately 10 to 15 sections through your region of interest for volume estimation. The stereological method uses point counting, as I mentioned before, as a, an efficient method for area estimation. With a grid, the intersections of the grid lines is related to the areas formed by the grid. By associating one area with a point located at each intersection, we will represent the entire area of the grid. So, each point will therefore represent a given area. Consistent marking is critical. So, these point counting uh, overlays are going to be represented by plus signs. And uh, it's not the entire plus sign that represents the area. Rather, it's just an infinitesimally small point. A practical way to do this is to identify um, and choose a quadrant. And so, uh, if this was your um, very tiny point that you're using to uh, include the plus sign as part of your area, you would approach from this angle. And if the region of interest overlies that portion of the plus sign, then you would include it. So let's put this into practice. With a grid, the intersections of each grid, each of the grid lines is related to the areas formed by the grid with each point. By associating one area with a point located at each intersection, we will cover the entire area of the grid. Each point actually represents an area. This means that we can estimate the area occupied by an object in the section by a random placement of the grid on the section and counting the number which fall onto the object. And so you can see here that this plus sign would not be marked to be included in the estimate because um, I'm using the very center of the plus sign as uh, my unique point for marking, and it does not fall within the region of interest, so that would not be marked. Your decisions for marking um, cavalier er, the points must be done in an unbiased method. You need to examine the boundaries and make sure that you're consistent. So if we're marking this, calculating the area of the striatum, we'll, we'll place points on all of the, the points that overlay the striatum, and then examine closely those which are at the boundary regions of the striatum and make individual decisions on whether or not these guys fall within the region of interest. Those wholly contained within the region of interest are, are easy to make that decision, but you need to carefully examine the boundaries. We've already discussed that 10 to 15 sections through your region of interest is recommended, but how many points do you really need to get a good estimate? Before we look at this question, though, let's take a moment to revisit an important concept, accuracy and precision. With sampling, a given estimate of a population will vary from the true and unknown number. Sampling design can yield a high accuracy but low precision so that each estimate varies from each other yet are clustered at the true number. Or it can be highly precise but low in accuracy so that replication can yield similar estimates which are not close to the true number. Finally, it could be both accurate and precise with estimates clustered together near the true number. The goal of stereology is to ensure that the individual sampling error does not overshadow the difference due to experimental manipulation. And so, we always want um, high accuracy, and then the precision is uh, something that can be chosen based on the experimental design. So choosing parameters. To demonstrate how this is done, uh, in a single animal I performed the Cavalieri estimation of the striatum with different grid sizes to see the effect. I performed each estimate three separate times meaning three random grid throws for each grid size. The striatum was identified on 11 sections, which were spaced 300 microns apart. When the grid size is large, uh, that is 1,000 microns, you can see that the variance of the estimates is also large. 
As you decrease the grid size, the variance between each estimate decreases. So we can see that grid size does relate to um, the, the variance of the volumes as you uh, examine a particular region. And so how much effort does this correlate to? So if instead of looking at the volume, we're going to examine how many points were placed, you can see that with a grid size of 1,000 by 1,000, only 44 points were placed across 11 sections of the striatum. Conversely, with a grid size of 100 by 100, 4,000 points were placed. And then um, the intervening grid sizes in between produced varying numbers of grid points. I didn't manually place these 4,000 points. I used a, a, a feature in Stereo Investigator that allows me to use an existing contour and fill the number of, fill the contour with the points automatically. So the, the software goes through and examines each grid point to see whether or not it's contained within the contour and only places markers for those grid points that are actually contained within the contour. Uh, so this was actually very easy to do. It actually took me longer to generate these two graphs uh, than it was to do each of these grid sizes three times each using that method. Uh, so the only thing that we need to do um, is decide how many points are, are sufficient. And we, If we could just go back to the volume again real briefly, you can see that the volumes uh, cluster together pretty closely um, as soon as you get less than 400 for your grid size. So um, you can see that anything over 200 points is, is where that rule of thumb comes from. This is going to vary though with your region of interest and what you're actually examining. So let's do the same thing this time with the hippocampus. And so instead of being rather softball shaped, so very regularly shaped like the striatum, the hippocampus varies quite a bit along the rostral caudal axis. You can see here that the estimated volume varies dramatically um, for these large grid sizes. And it's only when you uh, approach a grid size that becomes uh, rather tight, so 250 by 250 or 100 by 100, that you begin to see um, very tight clustering of the volume estimates. Again, relating that to points, in this case you can see that the, the hippocampus, because it varies a lot in shape as you go along the sections, along the axis, that um, the points really begin to generate a good estimate once you get around 200 points. Cavalieri used to be done manually using acetate sheets that had uh, grid points placed on them and you would toss the, the acetate sheet onto an image of your region of interest and then manually mark each point. The software makes many aspects of the Cavalieri a lot easier. We get a true randomized throw of the grid each time because the software controls that and then marking points is uh, quite straightforward. We're going to talk about that after the break. Um, so let's pause now to address any questions that you have about what I've talked about so far. Please submit your questions via the question window. Okay, so uh, we have a couple of questions and uh, one of the questions is an interesting one. It's, it's uh, is volume affected by shrinkage of the tissue? Uh, because your volume estimate is based on your cut thickness and the interval, uh, it is going to be assumed that um, your volume estimate is based on, on the, the volume of the tissue prior to removing, or prior to the histology. If you want to be even more accurate, you can calculate a shrinkage correction using Archimedes' method, which is, which is pretty fabulous. In that case, you would uh, measure the volume of the brain prior to any histological processing, so once you remove it from the uh, skull. Mm -hmm. And actually, this is true for any object. It, you could be looking in the pancreas or, or lung. Um, and measure the amount of water displacement prior to beginning your your, the remainder of your histology and procedure. So that's something that you can do ahead of time. Michelle asks if we have to do a pilot of sorts to see the number of points that you've chosen is okay. And, and how do you do that? Uh, this, is, this is a great question because 
the Cavalieri is actually very straightforward to do, and it's and it's very easy to um, redo. Actually, it's not like the optical fractionator where a pilot study is a significant expenditure of time. For the Cavalieri, uh, testing various grid sizes is as simple as tossing the grid, um, placing the points, and just identifying whether or not you're going to get, um, say, 200 points or more within your region of interest. If you have contours of your region of interest already, this process is even faster and can be done in minutes, literally. If you don't have 10 to 15 sections through your region of interest, you just have to know that the closer you get to that number, the, the likelihood that there's overprojection error that's going to significantly, significantly impact your area or your volume estimate is going to be minimized. So if you have a very small region, let's say the amygdala, and you can only get six sections systematically through that, then, then use six. The, the, the point of 10 to 15 is to give you a benchmark to have an idea of, of how to design your experiment. There is no necessarily right or wrong answer. You are just going to, with more sections uh, approaching that 10 to 15 mark, um, you're going to balance efficiency with accuracy. Okay, we'll, we'll take one more question and then we'll move on to um, showing you how it's done in Stereo Investigator. If you have multiple areas of interest that you want to calculate the area and volume for, you should identify the grid size that's appropriate for each individual area. So, for example, if you're interested in the amygdala and hippocampus and they're both on the same section, um, you might, you'll definitely need different grid sizes, I would expect. Um, for, for those two regions. And what that would mean is that you would just throw the grid twice, once for the, the hippocampus and then once again for the uh, amygdala. If you switch markers between the two, everything is uh, copacetic. Stereo Investigator will keep track of your probe runs and, and export the results very clearly and cleanly for you. If you're measuring regions that use the same grid size, you can use the same throw of the grid and just change markers. And then you get uh, the volumes of those two regions um, simultaneously. And we're going to demonstrate that right now. So Alyssa is going to walk us through how to do Cavalieri Estimator in Stereo Investigator. First, you want to set up the serial section manager. The cut thickness and section interval are the most important you can always add more sections afterwards. For example, if your tissue was cut at 100 microns and you had every other section available, your interval would be 2 and your cut thickness would be 100. If you are working on the microscope, put on your slide with the first section, or if you are working with images, open up the image of your first section. Next, set the grid dimensions that are appropriate for your region. Points are cheap when you are using a contour, so you can lean towards a tighter grid if you are in doubt. The grid will be randomly placed on your screen over your section, so you can add markers to the points that overlay your region of interest. There are multiple ways to mark the grid points, and you can access the menu options with a right click. You can use paint, which uses the mouse to basically color the grid points with a marker, or if you have a contour drawn, you can use this to fill. You can also use marquee mode, which fills markers within a drawn box. Or replace mode can be used if there are markers that are already currently placed. You can also use erase mode, which acts just like paint mode, only erasing markers that are placed inappropriately. A decision that you have to make is whether or not you would like to draw a contour around your region of interest. An advantage would be if you are using the contour for another analysis, including cell counting with the optical fractionator. If you are using the contour to fill in markers, then your contour, contour must be accurate representation of your region. 
A disadvantage would be if your region is convoluted and therefore tedious to draw. For example, the cerebellum at a high magnification would be painful to accurately contour. Another option would be to combine the two and draw a contour, but not perfectly accurate. Fill the contour with markers and then check the edges of the region of interest at a, high, uh, at a high enough magnification to make sure that the markers are accurately placed on the correct grid points. You can do this by switching to a race mode to remove markers that are in the contour but not over the region of interest. Now we will move to Stereo Investigator for a demonstration of the Cavalieri probe. As you can see, I already have my serial sections all set up. But to first open the Serial Section Manager, you can use the Tools menu. You can also use this icon to edit the section, and this icon can be used to add a new section. So now we can begin the Cavalieri Estimator Probe by using the Probes menu. You want to enter an appropriate grid spacing for your region of interest and the cut thickness of your tissue. The program will throw down a random grid, and as you can see in green, the auto move box is also present. This will move to the next field of view when the mouse mute moves outside of it. First, we are going to place markers within the cortex. So we will select the correct marker, and this can be renamed by right clicking. Now we can right click and select the paint markers mode. I also like to have replace mode selected because if any mistakes are made, having this selected makes it easier to correct. You can increase the mouse cursor using the middle mouse wheel. Now we can hold down the left mouse button and whenever the cursor wheel moves over a grid point, a marker will be placed on that grid point. And as you can see, when we move outside the auto move box, it will move the field of view so you can easily continue. Remember at the edges of the cortical boundaries to carefully examine your quadrant of choice to check if the point should or should not be included within the region. If there is a larger region, you can right click and select marquee mode. Then you can draw a box around the grid points that should be marked and the program will automatically place markers on all the grid points that are within the box. As you can see, we already have the hippocampus proper, which includes the CA1, CA2, CA3, and fimbria, and the dentate gyrus already traced for this entire animal. So we can fill these contours with the appropriate markers and get the volume of these regions. Using Alt-N to move to the next marker on the list, and Alt-B to move back one marker is a great way to easily move between markers without having to move the mouse over to select the different markers. And this is a new feature for version 10. With the correct marker selected, we can now right click and select paint markers into contour. And we have the dentate gyrus marker selected, so we will click inside these contours and using Alt B to move back one to the hippocampus proper marker, we can click inside that contour and it will automatically fill. Then we can move to our next section in our serial section manager and we can also use the macro view as an easy way to move to a contour that is off of our field of view. And we have the hippocampus proper selected so we just have to click inside using Alt N to move to the next dentate gyrus marker and we can continue to fill. And Alt-B will move back. For this demonstration, 
we only have a couple images to go along with the tracings. As long as your tracings are accurate, you do not need to have the images present while you are filling the contours. And you just have to continue moving and switching between your markers and using the macro view to move to the appropriate field of view that you need to be able to view your, your region so that you can fill it. And as you can see here, I accidentally filled the dentate gyrus with the hippocampus marker. Since I have replace mode selected, I can simply select the correct marker and click inside the dentate gyrus contour and the wrong marker will replace with the correct marker. Now we have finished filling the hippocampus proper and dentate gyrus contours for this entire animal. So we can end the probe. Now we can review the results and using the shift key we can select all of the results and view. This will show us all of our parameters and also a summary for each marker that we placed. And these results can easily be exported to Excel. In the Excel page, we are given the summary for each marker, the area, volume, and also the CE. The parameter page will give us all of the parameters that we used and also we can see how many markers were placed in each section. There's also a chart of this and this can show that in which section how many markers were placed and this is also a good way to be able to tell if you're if you missed a section because there will be no markers that were and now we can close all of our windows. You can save the file and begin a new file for your next animal. Okay, so uh, we just demonstrated how to perform the Cavalieri estimator both with and without a contour. And once you have um, performed the Cavalieri, you can generate unbiased estimations of area and volumes of all the regions that have been evaluated. You can export these results to Excel or copy them to the clipboard. And the coefficient of error is calculated for the Cavalieri Estimator Probe. You choose the proper uh, coefficient of error calculation based on the anatomy, so the shape of your region of interest. The two coefficient of errors are um, M Gunderson's formula with uh, m equals 1 or m equals 0. The M is an a indicator of shape factor. And so uh, a shape of 1 is spherical, and then a shape of 0 is the opposite of spherical. So obviously it's a continuum. But uh, for something like the striatum, you might choose um, a Gunderson M equals 1 coefficient of error. Uh, for something like the hippocampus, where there is uh, dramatic changes as you go from section to section in the shape of the object or the region of interest, then you would choose m equals zero. When you have your results, you can um, put them uh, side by side together and, and see that um, the average volume for our control uh, striatum was 12.77 millimeters cubed. And the average volume for our experimental groups uh, was uh, quite a bit less at 7.35. The results can be displayed in microns or millimeters. And to 
uh, select that in Stereo Investigator, you would go to um, Options, General Preferences, and under Numerical Formatting, select millimeters or microns for each of the measurements that will be reported. Another way that you can use the plot that Alyssa just showed you is to actually gain some information about, about what's going on in your, in your tissue. In this particular case, we, uh, we're doing a lesion study, and each of these different lines, symbols, represents a different animal's lesion. And by plotting the number of cavalieri points per section um, along the rostral caudal axis, we were able to identify um, how well our lesion was placed in our region of, you know, in relative to the animal. And so this olive um, animal, for example, had a uh, shallow but extensive um, lesion along the rostral caudal axis, while this orange animal had a very um, deep but um, um, tightly contained lesion. And so those are just a couple of things that you can uh, use the Stereo Investigator data export to, to glean some more information from, from your experiment in addition to the area and volume estimates that, are, that the Cavalieri is designed to do. Um, we're asked if uh, what area means, and it's, it's the, it is not the surface area of the structure. It is, it's just, just area. We can use the contours from the optical fractionator workflow. So if you are performing a number estimation using the optical fractionator, after you've completed that operation, you can launch the Cavalieri probe and quickly fill um, those markers into the contour. It's important, though, that the contour is an accurate representation of your area of interest. So if your contour was loose for the optical fractionator, because the rules for the optical fractionator only maintain that the region be contained within the contour, um, you would just have to make sure you examine all the boundaries to make sure that um, the number of points placed is, is an accurate rep representation. Okay, so since we brought up uh, the optical fractionator, this is a good, good time to talk about combining methods to create a story. So. Um, in a lot of cases, people are interested also in density, so where you express the number of objects per unit volume. Uh, I'd like to recommend that you measure the volume and number independently, so you know the reason underlying the density change. Um, this will happen if you use the Cavalieri method for estimating volume, so the Cavalieri probe to estimate volume, and the optical fractionator to estimate number. Importantly, you want to avoid the reference trap, which is that volume should represent the region, not the population. To indicate that, or to illustrate that, I suppose, um, and since we live in Vermont, I decided to use a cow example. So, um, the number of objects, in this case cows, estimated with the optical fractionator uh, does not care about the distribution of the objects at all. Um, in, in the case of how many there are. The volume and density is, is not a factor. Um, so if you were to delineate the objects to be counted on the basis of the, the number of cows that you see in far, Farmer Joe's field, the density measure is, is not going to be very meaningful because we'd want to know the volume of Farmer Joe's field indicated by the blue line um, and divide that by the uh, number of objects, in this case cows. Um, this, is, this comes into to play when you're, when you're dealing with um, regions, anatomical regions that are um, often defined by the presence of, of a particular cell type, like the substantia nigra or the raphe. So you just want to make sure that when you're delineating your region of interest, that it's done on the basis of anatomical criteria and not solely the um, dopaminergic or serotonergic uh, neurons in that case. So just a, just a cautionary tale, something to think about. Okay, so let's pause and um, please 
post your questions about using the Cavalieri estimator and uh, we'll address them. Okay, so we have a question from Michelle. She asks, when using the Cavalieri, do you have to check to see if the markers chosen by the computer are within the contour? Um, no, if you're using paint into contour, the software will only place markers that are within that contour. You do need to ensure, though, that the contour accurately represents your region of interest. And if it's a loose contour, or there are errors in the, in the way that the contour is drawn, you need to examine the, the boundaries of your region of interest to make sure that no um, grid points were, were marked in areas where the, the tissue wasn't. Um, in the example I showed earlier, if there was a contour for the striatum that uh, was rather loose so that it extended into the corpus callosum, we would know that when we looked at it that the contour contained the striatum, but it wasn't exclusive of all other regions. And so when we uh, play, painted the markers into the contour, we would just have to make sure that no markers were over the corpus callosum. And if they were, they needed to be erased. We're asked if you can combine the optical fractionator with Cavalieri to measure blood vessels and tumor sections. Um, actually, I think the probe that we're going to demonstrate next might be uh, an appropriate um, probe for you to consider if you're interested in um, blood vessel uh, angiogenesis within a tumor model. So uh, stay tuned and, and uh, uh, ask the question again if you don't think the area fraction fractionator would be appropriate for your estimation. We're asked if there are any magnification limits that we should be aware of while looking at the tissue and using the method. For the Cavalieri estimator, because it's a two-dimensional probe, the rule for the magnification is simply, can you see your region of interest? So can you accurately define your boundaries for your region of interest? So you need to be at a high enough power to be able to see that. Stereo Investigator allows you to easily switch magnifications within our software so you could do the majority of the region at a low magnification and then go up to high magnification just to examine the boundary regions and and clean up the edges as necessary okay so uh, let's talk about um, the area fraction fractionator now so cavalieri is used to find the area or volume of an entire structure the area fraction fractionator is used when you have a small subregion, such as lesions or plaques, within a larger region. Um, and I think this might be appropriate for uh, blood vessels within a tumor as well. This method, the area fraction fractionator, was developed by Auguste de Les, a French geologist who proposed over 150 years ago that in rock comprised of a number of minerals the area occupied by any given mineral on the surface of a section of the rock is proportional to the volume of the mineral in the rock. So to calculate the area of minerals in a sample, Deleuze confirmed that it, by examining a cut plane, it was possible to determine how much of each mineral was contained within the entire volume. To do this, the ratio of the area occupied by the mineral, in this case blue, was expressed relative to the total area of the rock, in this case orange. This principle is valid when applied to surfaces other than rock samples. So it didn't take long before microscopists realized that the Deleuze principle could be applied to tissue sections. So if you're interested in estimating the plaque load, for example, um, you would calculate the plaque volume and divide it by the hippocampal volume. And this is a volume fraction, so you could calculate the percentage of the hippocamp hippocampus that is occupied by plaques. In order to do this, we're going to use the fractionator principle. And this is introduced by a systematic spacing and random placement of the grid. The reference space represents the area of the region of interest selected for sampling. So the area sampling fraction is the reference space area divided by the grid size area. You'll recognize this uh, area sampling fraction if you do other stereological probes like the optical fractionator. 
because the optical fractionator also uses the fractionator principle for sampling. So systematic random sampling is done because the grid spacing and the reference space size are the same throughout all sections. The location of the grid and therefore the reference space is always random and that's provided by Stereo Investigator. And so you can see here that the, the reference space, in this case this light green box, is systematically spaced so that they're always the, uh, the same distance between each other in X and Y, but the placement, the start point of the grid is going to be randomized. So the number of, of reference spaces that intersect your region of interest is going to be different with each probe throw. To calculate plaque load using the area fraction fractionator, we're going to estimate the area using point counting performed on systematically selected fraction of tissue. The sampling is done at low magnification and on one plane. So we would place one marker for the subregion, that is the plaque, and then a second marker for the area within the contour, so the, within the region, so that would be the hippocampus. And then the plaque load is simply the area of the plaques divided by the area of the hippocampus. And because of Deles's principle, A sub A is equal to V sub V, um, the area fraction is equal to the volume fraction. We can see how this is done in Stereo Investigator. First you want to set up the Serial Section Manager. And again, if you are working on the microscope, put your slide with the first section on. Or if you are working with images, open up the image of your first section. Next, we trace a contour around the region of interest. This is where Area Fraction Fractionator and the Cavalieri probes differ. In the Cavalieri Estimator, you have the choice to draw a contour. But with the area fraction fractionator, you must draw a contour, so the systematic random grid can be placed over the region of interest, and this is done using the boundaries of the contour. Then we will set the grid dimensions that are appropriate for the region. The guidelines of point counting will apply to the subregion, so you will want to ensure that you will visit enough sites so the grid will overlay the subregion to mark at least 200 points, but hopefully more. To mark the reference space, all you have to do is click the middle mouse button to fill with marker 1. Then place a second marker on the grid points that overlay the subregion. The subregion is shown here as the APP labeled plaque. Replace mode is always on so that when the second marker is placed, marker 1 is deleted. Remember, this is a two-dimensional probe. Even though you may be tempted to focus through the tissue, don't. There are multiple ways to mark the grid points for the subregion. We can use paint mode, which uses the mouse to basically color the grid points with a marker. Marquee mode can also be used, which will fill markers within a drawn box. Or fill mode can be used if the subregion takes up the entire reference space. Erase mode can also be used to delete inappropriately placed markers. Now we will move to Serial Investigator for a demonstration of the Area Fraction Fractionator probe. So again, you want to have your serial sections already set up. And then we, using the probe menu, we want to define our counting frame for the reference space. This will depend on the size of the subregion, and you don't want it too large so that your efficiency is affected because you have to take a long time to scan the reference space for the subregion. Once that is defined, we can begin the area fraction fractionator probe. Enter in the appropriate grid spacing for the region of interest and ensure that you will visit enough sites where the subregion is present. The program will throw a systematic random grid using these dimensions. Finally, you'll want to enter the grid spacing for the point grid. This that is appropriate for the size of the reference space and also the frequency of the subregion. For example, if the subregion is small and infrequent, you want this grid spacing tight so that enough points will be marked on the subregion. So now we will select the marker for the subregion. 
At the first site, we'll use the middle mouse button and this will automatically fill marker 1, as you can see in the summary, all, on all of the grid points that are within the contour. Using F2, we can move to the next site. And again, using the middle mouse, you can click and it will automatically place the points. And as you can see, there is a plaque here, so we can left click and place our points. We can also right click and make sure that we are in paint mode and also replace mode. So when we place this point, it automatically replaces it with the plaque marker and deletes the hippocampus marker. And then using F2, we can move to the next site and again repeat. Clicking the middle mouse will fill the reference space, but notice it obeys the contour, so it only fills in markers that are within the contour. And as you can see, the contour was not tight to our region, so going into erase mode, we can erase the markers that are not over the region. And remember at the edges of our subregion boundaries to carefully examine the quadrant of choice to ensure that the point should be included. So whenever you're placing a, a marker over your subregion, you want to make sure that it should actually be included using the point counting rules so that the center of the grid point is actually over the subregion. Once the probe run is complete, you can view the results. By going to probe and display probe run list. And then once that is selected, you can click view results and you will get all of your parameters and also a summary of your markers. And the most important result is the area fraction, which gives the percent that the subregion occupies within the entire region of interest. And here, only five markers were placed, so this is not an accurate area fraction. And this is where you want at least 200 markers to be placed within the entire subregion. One other point that I just want to make is that for our demonstration, we made the size of the markers very large so that you can see them uh, via the webinar. It's much easier to see the grid points um, when you're doing this for yourself because the, the marker sizes aren't quite so large. But uh, I just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware of that, that you can adjust the size of the markers and we did that in order to make it easy for you to see um, what was being placed while we were doing it. Okay, so um, the Cavalieri and Area and Fraction Fractionator are uh, two probes that are used to calculate areas and volumes, or area fractions and volume fractions, respectively. I just want to take a couple of minutes to um, let you know what you should be reporting in your method section when you're presenting these results for publication. Uh, it's important that you provide the histology details, so what you're staining it with and, and, um, and uh, the probe that was used, so the Cavalieri or the area fraction fractionator, the total number of sections that were evaluated, the cut thickness and section interval, the boundary criteria. This is especially important for regions that are uh, um, can be difficult to delineate. So the difference between, or the boundary between the ventral tegmentum and the substantia nigra, for example, providing criteria for those um, uh, determinations are, are critical. In addition, we need to 
uh, have the point counting grid dimensions as well as a coefficient of error and this only applies to the Cavalieri. There is no coefficient of error calculation for the area fraction fractionator. If you have done the area fraction fractionator there's a couple of other things that you need to report. So in addition to everything that I just mentioned you need to mention the area sampling fraction which is the reference space dimensions divided by the grid spacing between reference spaces. So in conclusion, you can use Stereo Investigator and a smart experimental design. This will save you time without sacrificing accuracy for your area and volume estimations. The Area Fraction Fractionator Probe is a very efficient method for estimating a volume fraction. So, uh, which is very handy for things like plaque load. Uh, let's pause and address any questions that you have. Uh, I just wanted to mention that the, uh, for the area fraction fractionator um, demonstration, we used a three-channel fluorescent confocal virtual slide that was created with our virtual slice module um, in Stereo Investigator. That, the three channels were uh, blue was DAPI, Green was uh, GFAP, so it was labeling astrocytes, and uh, red was APP, as Alyssa mentioned earlier. Our other virtual slides that we demonstrated earlier for the Cavalieri um, uh, images of the entire cerebrum were, calcul er, were created using the virtual slice module in bright field mode. If you wanted to create a three-dimensional virtual image, that would be virtual tissue. And that's available um, in Stereo Investigator, Neurolucida, and Microlucida as well. Ah, um, Michelle has a great question. She asks if you can use the area fraction fractionator to estimate the number of a type of cell relative to the volume. That is the number of dead neurons per hippocampal volume. And um, actually, no, I'd recommend something, something different. Um, because you want to estimate the number of dead cells, I would recommend the optical fractionator to estimate the number of cells, and then use the Cavalieri estimator to estimate the hippocampal volume. And that will give you, and then if you wanted to calculate a density, you could, or as I would recommend, you would report each of the three values separately. Uh, Leif asks if the area fraction fractionator, if it's necessary to use sections that are at least 30 microns thick. Uh, and it's a two-dimensional probe, so you can use those 10 micron thick sections. So the area fraction fractionator, just to, to um, expand on a little bit, does not give you an estimate of number. So it, it is not appropriate for numbers of objects in a volume. Uh, rather, it is appropriate for objects, or uh, for... Um, a volume fraction, so the percent of the hippocampus occupied by plaque, or the percent of a tumor occupied by blood vessels, things like that. So Dr. Hobley asks if we can calculate vessel density per area, and you would use the area fraction fractionator as a method of choice for that. Russell asks, uh, well, he states that he's looking at stroke volume through the entire cortex. And would the Cavalieri probe work for this? Uh, certainly. If you are looking at, um, if the infarct is, is large, uh, the Cavalieri is perfect for, for this methodology. Um, and then that way you could use a marker for the stroke, uh, the area of the tissue that has been affected by the stroke, so um, your dying tissue or something like that. And then a second marker for the cortex itself. If instead you're looking at... Um, micro um, infarcts, so you're looking at uh, very small areas that, that are, are dying, the area of fraction fractionator might be more appropriate for that, so that if you have lots of small areas that are affected by your stroke model, then the area of fraction fractionator would be a better method. There is a, there's a, another question asking about um, using a microscope versus um, virtual images, uh, either created with uh, an Imperio slide scanner or with our software, uh, Virtual Slice. And because both of these probes are two-dimensional, these are excellent applications for these virtual images. So that would be a perfect application. 
Colleen asks if the tracing used in the optical fractionator is an exact representation of the area we want a volume measurement for. Is there any reason we can't use the volume measurement given by air optical fractionator? The volume measurement given by optical fractionator is a planimetric measurement. And is there any advantage to using the Cavalieri in this case? Um, that is completely up to you, Colleen. If you are going to report planimetric area or volume, please make sure that you state that as well as if you decide to do area or volume measurements with a Cavalieri probe, you should ensure that you mention that you use the Cavalieri probe to calculate your area and volume measurements. Okay, that's all the time we have today. I want to thank you for your attention and, and the very lively uh, field of questions that uh, everyone has been posting. It's been great. Uh, please email any additional questions that you have to info at MBF Bioscience. And please, please, please visit our websites. Let us know what you think and what you want to see next. Have a great day.